Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So today I want to talk about don't disqualify your dream. And I want us to turn to Genesis chapter 37. And we're looking at verses 5 to 7. Genesis chapter 37, we're looking at 5 to 7. And it says, uh, I'll read from your screen so that we can see. It says, now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream, which I have dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in the field, then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheep. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that even as we come this evening, that your children would be impacted, Lord God, and they would even receive a breath of fresh air coming directly from you, Lord God, that would inspire, that would awaken, Lord God, the dreams that you've placed on the inside of them. Father, you have seen what they have gone through, whether it be hatred, whether it be envy, something that has caused them to be discouraged. Father, I declare that you're shaking them out, Lord God, of that which had caused paralysis. And I declare in the name of Jesus, you're causing them to be mobilized and energized and activated towards fulfilling the dream that you've placed on the inside of them. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. It's interesting that Apostle Ken, he didn't know what I was going to preach about today, just the title. I haven't. I only shared with him the title and some scriptures. There are no points. And it was interesting that he was talking about limitations that you've placed on yourself and others and the limitations that others have placed upon you. It, it's, 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 it's prophetic because when we're talking about dreams, these things tend to happen. But... Before we go into that, what is a dream? A dream is a desire on the inside of you to do something big, to do something that you have never done before. It is a hunger deep down within that inspires you to reach for something more in life. It's a vision of life greater than you are currently experiencing. It's a vision of something greater than you are currently experiencing. But I want to say the first thing is a dream is not a thought. And there are many things you can think about, but sometimes they are not in tune with reality or they are not extraordinary enough as to be classified as a dream. And let me give you an example. You can think, in the first instance, you can think from now until eternity about being able to fly. I'm not talking about being able to fly in an aeroplane, being able to translate in the spirit, or just jumping really high like Mike, Mike, Michael Jordan. You can, I'm talking about actually flying. You could look at Superman movies from now until you are exhausted. You could even go at the top of a building and pray in tongues until, uh, until your mouth is dry. And if you jump off and you hope to God that you'll be able to fly, but I'll tell you something, the law of gravity will possibly have its say, unless God champions some angels to catch you. The other category is thinking a thought that doesn't qualify as a dream. And this could be likened to somebody, let, let's say somebody struggling for money, right? And they're thinking, oh my God, it is my dream so that I can get that $3,000 at the end of this month to pay my rent. But I wouldn't say that classifies as a dream because one, it is based on something attainable in the short term and it, it is based on something that you want to attain to address a, short, a pressing need. Now, a dream is something that would take some time to manifest. We're, we're talking about long term. There's a gestation period, yeah? It can, be, it can be brought about or inspired by a current pain, but it is not meant 
to address the current pain that you're experiencing in the short term. I'll say that again. A dream is something that would take time to manifest. There's a gestation period. It can be brought about by your current pain, but it is not meant to address your current pain in the short term. A dream is not always a vision that, will, that you'll get while you sleep, but it is a vision that will definitely keep you awake. The great poet Martin Carter says, I do not sleep to dream, but I dream to change the world. That's one of my favorite quotes. But how do you get a dream? Number one, you can get a dream by a vision in the night, like Joseph. Genesis 37, 5-7, as we just read. But the other type of dream, the other, the other way you can get a dream is let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16, and we're looking at verses 6 to 30. All right. And it says, So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab, talking about Samuel here, and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, Jesse the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest. And there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him. For we will not sit down until he comes here. So he sent and he brought him in. Now he was ruddy with, a bright, with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him. For this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. So we see another way you can get a dream is via a prophetic utterance, act or sign that awakens your mind and activates your heart to the potential that God has placed in your life. It's a prophetic utterance or a sign or act that awakens your mind and activates your heart to the potential that God has placed in your life. And the third way you can get a dream is, because I know some of us, we might be thinking, well, I don't think a prophet has prophesied over me and I don't really get many dreams in a night. Sometimes it will come as a passion to do something great that will not let you go. And let's look at Psalm 132, verse 1 to 5, to show you that it could come as a passion that, a passion to do something great that will not let you go. It's not that you wouldn't let it go, but it will not let you go. And let's look at one, Psalm 132, 1 to 5, and it says, Lord, Remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob. Surely I will not go into the chamber of my house or go up to the comfort of my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. This is David here, inspired, saying that the, the desire to build a temple for the Lord has gripped my heart, has been infused with passion on the inside of me. The Lord had not commanded me to do it, but it is a dream on the inside that he has placed. It's a vision that he has placed 
that will not let me go. And we can see that, yes, he didn't get the chance to fulfill it, but he passed it on to his son, Solomon. I'm not saying that would be the case with you or, or, or any of us. But sometimes a dream comes with like a passion that just won't let you go. But invariably, when we have dreams, people will come to disqualify your dreams. And sometimes the biggest person that will disqualify your dreams, you're looking at them in the mirror. You're looking at them in the camera. It's internal disqualification. The first kind of disqualific internal disqualification is the internal disqualification of ability. I am not skillful enough or experienced enough to go after this dream. And we're not going to turn to it, but you can take it down for your own notes. Exodus 4.10. This is where Moses was giving the Lord excuses. I am not eloquent enough to go speak to these people. I don't have the experience like they have. How can I pursue this dream? I can't speak as well as Apostle Ken, but yet you've called me to preach. I don't understand it. I don't have the mathematically uh, 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 mathematical bent or the, mathem or, or the mathematically endowed mind like Sister Angie. But yet you've called me to solve these complex problems. How could you do it, Lord? The first type of internal, dis internal disqualification is your ability. You feel you get a prophetic word and you're wondering, how am I ever going to accomplish this? It seems like I don't have this skill. The second type is your help. Some people are just too tired to accomplish this dream. It's just so much. Or I'm just so sick. It don't look like I could accomplish this dream. You hear some church people saying, well, it's the diabetes, you know, it slow me down. I can't, I can't do this. But if we look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 20 to 22, we see the woman with the issue of blood who got rid of the excusitis of health. And she said, if only I can touch the garment, if only I can touch his garment, I will be healed. Let me tell you something. Don't let your health disqualify you. He is a healer and he can transform your life with healing to reposition you to fulfill the dream that he has placed in your heart. The third type of internal disqualification deals with your family. I don't come from a wealthy or a, fa a powerful family to be entrusted with such a dream. You know, some people will say God doesn't give us dreams. He makes us to be the hands to help fulfill the dreams of others. You've been so, you've been so programmed. It's almost as if it, like the Egyptians, when the Egyptians went out, they said, let us go back. Let's go back because Moses has took, taken us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness. At least when we were in Egypt, we knew we were going to get food. Not this piece of bread that's falling from the sky and these pieces of quail that turn worms in the morning. That's only sufficient for the day. They had a slave mentality. They had a slave mentality. They were so accustomed to the slavery when God was giving them freedom, they couldn't appreciate it. And it's the same way. Sometimes we're so programmed to, to, to think in a certain way. We're so programmed to operate in a certain sphere. When God is trying to bring us out, we always revert back to the culture. We always revert to the culture to which we were programmed. Sometimes growing up, we think about our family growing up. Well, my family didn't have much, so maybe that's my, that's, my, that's my portion in life. The, sec, the, the fourth internal disqualification marker is sometimes 
one of the greatest hindrances I've seen is your history, your reputation. My reputation is way too bad for me to fulfill the dream that God has for me. We see Saul saying in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, that he is the chief, and I am the chief, chiefest of sinners, as he persecuted the church. And sometimes we have so much history, sometimes we tend to say, I have too much baggage to accomplish this dream. If I go up to preach or if I go up to do anything, people will say, well, remember this, remember that, remember these, the, the litany of failures that has followed you. And sometimes they try to rub it in your face. And then finally, one of the greatest excuses or internal disqualifications is your age. I see some, I, I saw somebody wrote it. Your age. I am too young or I am too old to fulfill this dream. We see the Lord telling Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1, 7, do not say that you are too young. After Sarah was told that she would have a baby post 90, she laughed and she said, will a woman old as I am have pleasure in my old age? Listen, you're neither too old, you're neither too young. And I want to give you two stories. I think I probably told you some of these stories before, but I want to give you uh, the first story is of a person named Emmett Jr. And let me, let me tell you about his story. He was molested by men and women before he was 10 years old. It started when he was five. And sometimes when things were really bad at home, he would go underneath the floors in his house and let his imagination run wild. He grew up in severe poverty and his home was very abusive growing up. He said that his father had a philosophy that if there was something in you that he didn't like, he could beat it out of you. You know, some parents think like that. Listen, I'm going to beat it out of you until it's not there anymore. And sometimes, <laughs> and sometimes the only solace he had was when his mother started talk, taking him to church at the age of 16. At the age of 22, his dream of starting a business made him move to another city with his life savings of $12,000. That's U.S. His business venture failed. He was living out of his car for a very long time. It was only after trying and trying that it became a success after six years. His successes grew into greater successes and his business ventures grew bigger and bigger. Did I mention that at age 16, Emmett Jr. tried to distance himself from his father, so he legally changed his name to Tyler. His last name is Perry. But you might say, well, Tyler, Tyler Perry started to achieve success at a young age, 28 years old. That's that's relatively long. That, that's relatively young. Let's look at the next person. I'll tell you about somebody named David. And David's father passed away when he was six years old. He had to drop out of school and help his mother and his siblings when he was seven years old as a farm hand. At the age of 16, he faked his age and he enlisted into the army. He served a little while and then was discharged. He got hired by the railway and was fired for fighting. He had the opportunity to study law, but his career ended by fighting with his client. He started to sell life insurance, but he lost his job because of, well, you guessed it, fighting. He started a business selling boats. And he started to make some money, he got some stability, but then he couldn't resist going into the lamp business. And the lamp business failed. He opened a restaurant and a motel. And this was doing well. And it seems like Murphy's Law just had the better of him. The restaurant and the motel burned down. Starting over again, he had a recipe that he had perfected from his restaurant days. So he tried to sell it. He was rejected 1,009 times until one day a person asked him what he would call it when he got through. And he said... Well, I'm in Kentucky. Did I say his name? His name was Harland David Sanders. And he started Kentucky Fried Chicken in his 60s. You're never too old and your failures can teach you. Don't let internal disqualification hold you back. 
But it's not only internal disqualification. Sometimes there, there is external disqualification. And external disqualification comes in three ways that I have found. The first way is haters. Haters. You know, they say haters going to come. Genesis chapter 37 verses 5 to 8. We're going to read back that, 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 that portion of scripture. And it says, Now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers. And they hated him even more. And you notice they hated him even more after he told them. Eh? Let, 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 let's, let's move forward. So he said to them, Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in the field, and then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and indeed your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And then verse 8, it says, it said that, do you think that we will bow down to you? Ah, shall you reign over us? His brother said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. If you notice, Joseph never shared his dream or his vision with anybody else after that in the entirety of his story. He didn't. Haters came. And sometimes the haters are closer than you think. They came in the form of his brothers. They hated him for his dream because he made them feel small. And invariably there will be times where your dream will make others feel small. And that's why it's my suggestion. Be very careful with whom you share your dream. Be very careful because, you know, in, in, in Trinidad and in the Caribbean, we say not every skin teeth is a smile. It's true. And the second type of external disqualification is the envious, the envious. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 28. And it speaks about Eliab. This is after, now I'll give you a little context. David went to give his brothers some food while they were, uh, they were, they were poised um, to battle. Uh, well, they were, they were right outside uh, of the valley. They were between the valley uh, before, back, before David went to fight Goliath. And his father said, go carry the food for your, carry the food for your brothers and get wood. So he went. And then he heard some fellows talking about, listen, this is what the king is going to do if anybody kills Goliath. The king is going to let him live tax-free and he's going to give him his daughter to marry. And David was asking about it. And his older brother Eliab, his older brother Eliab ended up coming and, well, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 20. And he said, now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart. For you have come down to see the battle. This was the same Eliab who was rejected by Samuel. This was the same Eliab who experienced not just a rejection, but a turning of the tide. He was the firstborn. And normally in, the day, in, in that day and in Israel, the firstborn is conferred the double portion of honor. And this is, this is God now reversing the roles and causing the last to be first in David. And he saw David being anointed and he envied him because he represented what he did not accomplish. And sometimes you will represent in life what some people 
have not accomplished. And because of that, because they don't have a vision for themselves, they will envy you. That's all well and good. But that's the kind of external disqualification that will come. And if you are not sold on who your God is and that he has qualified you, you're going to buy it. You're going to buy what the haters are saying. You're going to buy what the envious are saying. And then the third type of external disqualification comes in the form of challenges. David was on the run from Saul for eight years. Could you imagine that? After he knew that he was called to be king, he was on the run for eight years. Sometimes God just gives you the dream, but he doesn't give you the challenges. He gives you the call, but he doesn't always tell you the cost. And David had to, he had to do something. He had to pay the price. He, he didn't let his external disqualification in the form of challenges derail him from fulfilling the dream that God had spoken over his life. I want to close by telling you certain things. The first, the first I want to talk, talk about is sometimes there's no explanation why people try to pull you down. They just pull you down sometimes because of fear and transferred fear. And I'll give you an example. There's a story about some monkeys. There were four monkeys left in a dark room and there's a pole. And at the top of the pole, there were some bananas. And what had happened was every time the first monkey went up, and before he grabbed the bananas, he was doused with water. He came right back down. The second monkey went up. He was, the same thing happened. He was doused with water before he grabbed the bananas, came back down. The third monkey went up. Before he grabbed the banana, he was doused. So what they did was they brought back in, they, they, they took out the first monkey, and they replaced it with a new monkey. And when he tried to go up, the others, there was no water. But they, before he tried to grab the banana, they pulled him down. And eventually, the whole room, they started to replace the old monkeys with a new monkey. And then all of the monkeys in the room were none of the monkeys that would were doused with water. And what happened? When any of them tried to go to the top, all of the monkeys pulled them back down. And they never they were never touched with water. Why? And this just this this just goes to show you sometimes people will try to pull you down not because they have experienced bad, but because they have heard about other people experiencing bad. And they want to stop you because they think you are going to experience bad. It's a cycle. Let me give you an example. Somebody had a bad experience investing in the stock market. They tell everybody, listen, don't invest in the stock market. It's gambling. You know, it's gambling. They can't, you can't do that. Then somebody else who has never invested in the stock market, what goes to somebody else who wants to invest in the stock market, maybe God put a dream in their heart concerning the stock market. No, listen, you can't invest in the stock market. You're going to lose money. Forget about all that statistical analysis. You will lose money. They never experienced it, but they have heard about somebody else's bad experience. They, were the, they are the monkeys that never got wet, but just saw everybody else pulling down the monkey, trying to get to the top and joined in. And sometimes people will just join in because they have no dream for themselves and try to pull you down. I want to leave you in the midst of internal and external pressures. One, God's glory will be revealed in your weakness. God's glory was revealed in the midst of Joseph's weakness. 
and in the midst of his apparent setback. And I'll tell you something even greater. In the midst of him being sold to the Egyptians, the Bible says Joseph was successful. In the midst of being sold and being placed into Potiphar's house, the Bible says Joseph was successful because why? The Lord was with him. Where some people thought it was the devil destroying God's purpose for the pain was greater glory. The second thing is God will bring the right people around you in the time of challenge. David, yes, he was challenged. He had haters. He had, and there are those that was envious. Saul, his brothers, he had challenges. He was on the run for eight years. But in the midst of it, he was surrounded by mighty men. You can check out in your own time, First Chronicles chapter 11. You can read that portion of scripture. And it shows David's mighty men taking a risk just to get him a glass of water. David didn't seek out these men. They sought him out. He didn't share with them any vision or any dream. What was on the inside of his heart caused them to act in a certain way and he attracted what was on the inside of him. I'll tell you something. You will attract people just like you. So if you are only attracting a certain crowd, you need to ask yourself, what is on the inside of me? God will bring the right people around you in the time of challenge. And the third thing is with faith and persistence, your dream will emerge. It took 13 years for both David and Joseph to come into the dream that God has placed in their hearts. 13 years. At 17, they were called one through a tumultuous, a tumultuous betrayal by his brothers. The other, it was through a promotion, being called into the king's service. Started differently, but yet in the midst of those, of those differences, you might look at somebody's uh, uh, walk and call and you might say, oh my God, they started with promotion and I started with demotion. But I'll tell you something, both of them rose to the top. Both of them experienced challenges. Both of them took 13 years or so to come into the dream that God had placed in their hearts. But it was through faith, persistence, and a commitment to serve, grow, and get better in all that they did. This was the reason they emerged victorious and walked into the reality of their dreams. They had persistence, they had faith, and they had commitment. They served God in spite. They sought God in spite. And you can do the same. In spite of external and internal disqualifications, you can let God rise on the, inter on the inside of you. Don't let disqualifications stick. But let God's qualification rise. He has qualified you. He has chosen you. He has equipped you. And he's telling you, you have everything that is necessary to accomplish the vision that I've placed in your heart. I have equipped you from before the foundations of the earth. I've called you and you have what it takes. Persevere. Stick with it. Have faith. And I'm telling you, God is going to see you through. God bless you, Kairos family. God bless you.